Hi guys, today I'm going to go over the Diels Alder reaction. I'll show you the mechanism, which is pretty simple, and I'll work out some examples. So, first off, why is the Diels Alder reaction so important? It actually won a Nobel Prize, so it's one of the most useful synthetic reactions in organic chemistry because many biological molecules contain rings in their structures. And as you can see, the product of our Diels Alder reaction also contains the ring. So, it's really important to know how can we form these rings? Okay, so the Diels Alder reaction is commonly known as a 4 plus 2 cycloaddition. The 4 refers to our diene, which is a 4 pi electron component, and the 2 refers to our dienophile, which is the 2 pi electron component. Here's the 1, 2, 3, 4 pi electrons, and your 2 pi electrons. Notice that our diene is a conjugated system, which means that there is a single bond between 2 pi bonds and our diene is known as our nucleophile since it is electron rich and our dienophile is known as our electrophile since it is electron poor. Also notice that our two components in um, the reactants they contain a certain amount of carbons that gets placed in our product. Notice that the diene has one, two, three, four carbon and the dienophile has one, two carbon and this ring structure also has a total of six carbon. One, two, three, four, five, six. These two four carbons, these four carbons comes from our diene, while these two carbons come from our dienophile. Also note that our dienophile usually contains electron withdrawing groups to stabilize our dienophile and make it more electrophilic. And our diene contains an electron donating group to make it more nucleophilic. Okay? So let's go and see some more examples. So as far as the mechanism goes, it's very simple. It is a one concerted step reaction, which means all of the bonds break breaking and all the bonds forming takes place in one step. So the most common way to do it is to take this pi bond, attacks this carbon, and the dienophile comes and attacks the diene underneath. So it comes in from the bottom and attacks and this pi bond in return moves up here okay and that's where you get this double bond in our product notice that we are taking two pi bonds and we're making them into single carbon bonds and we're taking um, the single bond and we're making it to a new double bond in our product okay and notice that there withdrawing group is still attached and the dienophile is attached if you're curious why I put the um, I'm sorry, if you're curious why I put the donating group on this carbon and not this carbon, just keep watching and I'll show you why certain products appear and why certain don't. Okay, so in our second example, we have a very simple diene. This time it's just a regular conjugated 4 pi electron system with no donating group. And our dienophile this time is an alkyne. Thus our product looks simply a little bit different, but it's the same concept. In our product, this time we have a cyclohexadiene instead of a cyclohexene, okay? We have a cyclohexadiene, which means that this is a cyclo cyclohexane ring with two carbon-carbon double bonds, hence the diene part. So let's go to the mechanism. It's pretty simple. This pi bond attacks the carbon here. This pi bond in return comes in from the bottom and attacks, so this pi bond moves here. And since we move this bond up here, this bond is now this new bond in our product. Notice that our alkyne has three bonds, so we're getting rid of this one bond, but we still have that one extra bond. That's why our product looks a little different, and we have this extra bond right here. Okay, This bond comes from this bond between the carbon and the carbon, okay? And as usual, we have our withdrawing group attached to our dienophile, and that's just hydrogen. I don't, I didn't need to draw that, but I just did it just to show you, okay? So what makes a good diene and what makes a good dienophile? Note that a diene is already sufficiently electron-rich to react, so it doesn't necessarily need a donating group. But if there is one, it will make it more nucleophilic, which is a good thing. Some examples of electron donating groups are R groups, your, it could be any alkanes, your OR groups, known as your alkoxy groups, 
Notice that the electron pairs helps donate electrons, which will make it a better nucleophile. In contrast, dienophiles require at least one electron withdrawing group in order for it to be reactive. Some examples of electron withdrawing groups are your NO2, you have your carbonyl groups, C double bonded to an O, um, you have your nitriles, carbon triple bonded to an N, you have other um, carbonyl groups, C double bonded to an O. This is an ester right here. So that's also a electron withdrawing group. Notice if you draw out the structure of NO2, it contains a positive charge on N. Here I'll draw it out. N double bonded to an O, bonded to an O, minus, and a positive. Notice that there is a positive charge directly on the nitrogen, which makes it a electron withdrawing group okay and the aldehyde right here is also an electron withdrawing group via resonance notice that oxygen is more electron withdrawing so it pulls the electrons away from the carbon giving it a partially positive charge same thing with nitrogen puts a pos partially positive charge on the carbon same thing with the ester right here okay so partially positive these positive charges directly on the carbons and the nitrogen here makes these good electron withdrawing groups. So when we're doing the Diels-Alder reaction we have to keep in mind that there are some stereochemical rules we have to follow. The stereochemistry of the dienophile must be retained in our final product. So in our two examples we have a cis uh, conformation and we have a trans conformation. So in our products we must also get a cis product and a trans product. I'll draw the first one. This bond attacks here. The diene file approaches the diene from the bottom. This bond moves in. So in our final product, we have a six carbon ring. We have our new carbon-carbon double bond. And my electron withdrawing groups of my diene file will be in a cis conformation. So I'm going to draw both of them on dash. Okay. So here we go carbon double bonded to an oxygen bonded to my methoxy group okay in our second example same concept this carbon attacks here the dienophile comes in from the bottom and this pi bond moves up so we have six carbon ring we have our new carbon carbon double bond and this time our product is must be in trans conformation so one of them is on dash and one of them is on wedge okay so carbon I'll just write it CO2, CH3, okay? CO2, CH3, okay? And another thing you want to keep in mind is that since the dienophile is approaching from the bottom, the dienophile pref uh, prefers the indo position. This is known as the indo rule. This is why I drew these two both on dash and not wedge because to show that they are following the indo rule, you draw them on dash, which means that they are pointing away from you, okay? In this next example, we get to observe the stereochemistry of our diene when it contains substituents. So in this diene, we have two methyl groups as our substituent, okay? And our dienophile is an alkyne, so let's go ahead and draw the mechanism, which is still the same. This pi bond attacks here, dienophile approaches from the bottom, this pi bond moves here. So our ring structure is 6 carbon, we have our new double bond. And we have a bond here from our alkyne. This bond right here stays here. Since we have a carbon-carbon double bond, it cannot rotate. This is It acts like a planar molecule, so our substituents cannot be used in any dash or wedge. Our substituent simply must be drawn planar since it is a carbon-carbon double bond. So this part is pretty easy. We just draw it in a planar stereochemistry, okay? So do not use dash or wedge whenever you have a carbon-carbon double bond. Now, for the stereochemistry of our diene, the easiest way to do it is to draw in your center atom, in this case an H, and on this carbon, our center atom is the methyl group. So the easiest way to do it is to follow a specific convention. The convention is to take your center atoms, and we're going to put them up means we're going to use a wedge, okay? So on this carbon, we have the hydrogen on a wedge, 
this carbon is right here so our hydrogen is on a wedge on this carbon our center atom is our methyl group facing inward and so that goes on a wedge that automatically makes our metal up here this metal it automatically makes it a dash and the hydrogen here must be on a dash okay so in our next example we get to work with cyclic reactants we have a cyclic diene and a cyclic dienophile this diene is known as cyclopentadiene abbreviated C PD. Cyclopentadiene is very reactive since it experiences ring strength, so hence it's very good diene. And our dienophile also contains an anhydride group with a partially positive charge on our carbon that makes it a good electron withdrawing group. Notice that we're still working with one, two, three, four carbons and one, two carbon from our dienophile. Okay, I'm going to circle them so you can see it better. We're still working with four carbon plus two carbon here. Okay, and this group right here, this is our substituent and this is our other substituent. So in our mechanism, we have this bond attacks this carbon here. This one approaches from the bottom. This bond moves up. So in our final product, I'm going to draw in my six carbon ring slightly differently. Notice that one, two, three, four, five, six carbon. These two carbon comes from here. These four carbon comes from this four carbon. I drew a little differently because you'll see in a second. So this part, we're going to move it up because that's the convention we're using. We take whatever atoms in the middle of our diene and we move it up. So to draw that, we're going to put these two carbon up, okay? So this carbon up, this carbon right here up, attached to these two carbon. Here's our up, okay? And now our dienophiles withdrawing group, remember it prefers the indo rule, so I'm going to draw it going downwards, okay? Indo means the dash or the down, okay? So facing downward, carbon, double bonded to an oxygen, carbon, double bonded to an oxygen, bonded to my oxygen, bonded to my oxygen, okay? And notice that we have our double bond right here, which came from moving this bond up here. And that's your final product, okay? Notice that we followed the indole position, and we moved the whatever um, atom is in the middle, we moved that up, okay? And we have our cyclohexadiene product with our bridged atom right here, okay? Sorry, what I meant to say is that we have our cyclohexene product, not cyclohexadiene. As you can see, there's only one alkene um, bond. Another thing I want to point out is that if you want to be sure that you drew your substituent of your el electrophile in an indole position, you can take your hydrogen and draw them on your exo position, okay? So you can take your hydrogen and put them on a wedge just, you know, to make sure you know that you're putting this group on the indole position. Another thing you want to keep in mind is that now you have a new bridge head which is anti to your um, substituent. You see how this is anti, which gives, which is why you're following the indo rule. If it, this was following the exo rule and you drew it going up, this group would go up and this group would go up and they would create steric hindrance, which means that they would take away from the stability of the product. So in this next example, we have our diene with a methyl substituent and a dienophile with a nitrile substituent. As far as the mechanism, it follows the same concept. This bond attacks here. The dienophile approaches from the bottom, which causes this bond to move in here. So we have our six-membered ring. We have our double bond here. And our nitrile group must follow the indo rule. So I'm going to draw that on a dash. Okay, And our... Um, metal group over here we have to find the stereochemistry the convention is to take whatever atom is in the center and move it up in the middle we have a H in the middle we have an H on the outside we have the H so we take these two hydrogens and we move them up which means we put them on a dash so the hydrogen goes on a I mean it means we put them on a wedge not a dash hydrogen goes on a wedge which automatically makes your metal on a dash okay notice that we don't observe any of this product right here 
you don't see this right here. Let me draw it out. CH3, H, you don't see any of your nitrile group on a wedge, okay? Because that would not be following the indo position. This must be an indo position, okay? So the last thing I want to point out is that in Diels Alder reactions, our products tend to follow a specific orientation. So if you count the number of carbons between your uh, donating group and your withdrawing group, you get one, two, three, four, which gives you a one four adduct known as a one four product, which is very stable. This is preferred, okay? And in the second example, if you count the number of carbons, you get one, two, three. A 1,3 adduct is not preferred, so you want to avoid any 1,3 adducts between your uh, donating and withdrawing group because it creates a very, very high transit state. And our third example, if you count it, you have 1, 2. So 1, 2 adduct is also preferred. So when you're drawing your Diels Alder reaction, just make sure that your products are, do not um, contain any 1,3 adduct because it is highly unstable in the transition state. Okay guys, I hope this video helped. If you have any questions, just send me a quick email.